Malik Elzey, a four-star recruit, commits to the University of Cincinnati, but who else is on the Bearcats' radar? Let's talk recruiting. Let's keep the train rolling here on Locked On Bearcats. Our Locked On Bearcats, your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen of every day. It's free and available everywhere. You get your podcast and on YouTube. Subscribe to our Lockdown Bearcats YouTube channel up to 387 subscribers and counting. Follow us, too, to get an alert every time we drop a new episode. Former sports director of University of Cincinnati's Bearcats Media, Alex Frank, here with you, your host each and every day. And today, it's our weekly football recruiting conversation with none other than the director of of football recruiting for Sports Illustrated, John Garcia Jr. Our conversation to this week and every week is presented by LinkedIn Jobs. I'd like to thank LinkedIn for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Lockdown College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college terms and conditions apply. All right, John, so good to have you back. The last time we had you, was when you were, excuse me, out in Los Angeles for the elite, excuse me, elite 11. Um, what can you tell us about that? And are there any targets for the Cincinnati Bearcats that were out there? Well, there's a commitment out there, right? Uh, Brody Jarvis yeah. was, was, of course, there. One of the most, of the interesting, most interesting quarterbacks, quarterbacks in this entire in this class, entire right? A guy who's has as much rushing production as any of the best dual threats in the country. But the elite 11 is about throwing the ball. Uh, so I thought he got better as the camp progressed. I think the pro day script, which is, which is probably the probably hardest, the hardest event, um, and the one that is so one to one comparatively from an evaluation standpoint, because all these guys do the same, you know, script of throws. I thought that's where he looked the best. You know, um, one of my competitors charted him with 16 on target passes out of 20. Uh, we had him among the top 10 or 12 performers as well that day. And, and I think that says a lot because everybody, Alex, understands that this year is kind of the year of the quarterback in recruiting. So if you're even invited to the Elite 11 finals, to me, it's a big deal. And most people, including yours truly, consider him to be a bit of a developmental option from a truly complete quarterbacking standpoint. Um, we, we know the athleticism, the size is all certainly there, um, but he looked really good, particularly on those third level passes. So I thought that was encouraging relative to the expectation compared to some of these other more polished, experienced passers that were taking part in, in this national event. So I think the future is bright for that Cincinnati quarterback room. Uh, it's, it's been strong over the years. And I think every year we see that, on a consistent basis. You know, last year, Luther Richardson was one of the Elite 11 surprises as, as a future Cincinnati Bearcat. So now to pair him with a guy like this, I think is really interesting when you start to talk about building a, a quarterback room because you want depth, but you also want variation. And I think Luther is a little bit more big physical pocket guy, although he's got enough functional athleticism to challenge you outside. And then Brody's kind of this do-everything quarterback. At least he projects as this you-can-do-everything quarterback, RPO type of guy. Think more of, of your Evan Praters of the world as opposed to Richardson, who's a little bit more Desmond Ritter in his game. So, again, that variance is something you want to stack in your quarterback room with, with young talent, and that's what Cincinnati appears to be doing. All right, so let's talk about the biggest commit that has happened recently for Cincinnati. That's Malik Elsey, four-star recruit. What can you tell us about him, John? Just an impressive athlete all around. Big, physical, great vertical game. He's got some ball skills that are, are really among the best in the country. I think the production is absolutely there. Uh, the, the, certainly the recruiting competition was there, right? As you mentioned, Blue Chip Recruit offers from around the country so it, it, it just hits different and i know this is true at cincinnati it hits different when you beat up the power five for a recruit uh, there's really no other way to put it i know cincinnati will be a power five school very soon but at this point it still feels different when cincinnati can go toe to toe and, and win uh some of these battles honestly a lot of these battles thus far in the class of, of 2023 and, and he might be the most impressive win just because 
of the value we're seeing at that position. It is increasing. People want dynamic vertical receivers, and that's exactly what Malik is. And I think what, what makes him even more superior is just the contested catching ability. There's this basketball-like bounce that, that he provides, um, but also translating over from the hardwood, there's this contested ability, like going up for a rebound, getting banged on you know, at the mid-level, you're still coming down with the ball in the end. And I think there's something to be said for that. Yes, he's tall. Yes, he's fast. Great ball skills and body control, but he could also go up and, and win some of those physical battles, which really makes him – potentially maximize his game at the next level. So I think he's kind of a classic wide receiver one uh, for anybody, no matter where he ended up. Certainly at Cincinnati, that would be the expectation as well. And, and again, we continue to see strong skill position development and recruiting at UC, something we've, we've talked about a lot in the secondary, much more in the secondary to date because the secondary class is so big. So impressive to date, Dale McCullough, certainly Amari Snowden, these guys. Uh, but now some of the other positions and the skill levels uh, are, are also filtering into Cincinnati. So I thought that was a really big summer win uh, for the Bearcats and another indicator that this this is more of a constant. This is not – we shouldn't be as surprised when some of these decisions come down. No. So we saw them pick, pick off an SI-99 recruit last year with Eugenio, and we're seeing more consistency. Elite 11 quarterbacks, great skill players, developmental linemen that, that are going to be big-time players uh, no matter what conference they're playing in by the time they see the field uh, with the Bearcats. I think that's a great point because there have been so many high-profile recruits in recent years that you know this sh it should be, you know, I think to your point, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, we can be impressed that they were able to land that guy, but, you know, it should be more commonplace now at a school like the University of Cincinnati. Now, you, in your um, description of Elsie, it kind of sounds like you're talking about him as if you were Alec Pierce. Is that your player comparison for him? I, I figured you were going to go there. Yeah, I mean, I think Alec was, was a little bit more polished from a route running perspective coming out, but in terms of the sheer – size, speed, and ceiling factor, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where you naturally go. Uh, and I think, again, it just it presents such a mismatch. So if Malik can polish up like Alec did over his first couple of years in town, it, it really is kind of a sky's the limit situation. There's all conference and, and maybe more potential in Malik's game just from a natural standpoint. So once the technique starts to match it that catch radius expands the playmaking will expand and most importantly the trust between player and coach will expand and that will all push him on the field that much sooner how about that all right when we come back um we're gonna switch to the other side of the ball we're gonna talk about some linebackers because we i've been meaning to talk to you about this including two a pair of brothers that are currently on the bearcats team what you remember about when they were going through the recruitment process how important that position is going into the Big 12. We'll explain that after a word from Built Bar. If you haven't tried the Puffs yet, you are depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys, and it's true, because there's a new flavor, and let me tell you, it's really damn good. It's called Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs. They have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks, and, of course, they're covered in 100% real chocolate, all the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it, plus it's healthy for you. They're only 160 calories. They have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them as well. So, like all Built Bars, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That means they're healthy and tasty, and they're covered with a light, fluffy texture. You are going to love this new cookie dough chunk puff. Whether you need a snack for your workout, a late night treat, or just need to grab a quick bite, I've been there in all three situations. Built is the perfect protein bar, and they taste better than a candy bar. Ditch the calories, fat, and sugar. Grab yourself a Built Bar. Go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Our conversation with John Garcia, Jr., the director of football recruiting for Sports Illustrated today and every week is presented by LinkedIn Jobs, thanking them for being the official recruiting sponsor of the college or the Locked On College Network. Excuse me. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. Terms and conditions do apply. So the I think the most interesting part of this team, John, and maybe the best part of the, about this Bearcats team in 2022 is the linebacking duo of Ivan and Deshaun Pace. What can you tell us about when they were going through the recruitment process coming from a, a powerhouse high school in Colerain and now – 
Deshaun is, I mean, he's on the Chuck Bernard watch list. And Ivan was the uh, PFF's MAC Defensive Player of the Year just re- uh, last year. What can you tell us about those two players? Yeah, so fascinating to see these two being able to play together again for the first time since high school. And they won a whole heck of a lot of games together at the high school level, like you said, at one of the best uh, and most notable schools in the state of Ohio. So really cool just from a just from a journalistic standpoint to see these two reunite uh, and get to play together theoretically next to each other, uh, literally uh, at the next level at, at a school that is you know going to open up, I think, in the top 10 and, and didn't have a whole lot of expectation behind it. So, so that is really cool to see. And I think what's interesting about these two, Alex, is that they're kind of complementary. I think Ivan is more of the traditional linebacker, right? Volume tackler, unbelievable instincts for the football and can rush the passer just a little bit like you want modern linebackers to do to provide that three down value. And then Deshaun, the younger brother, is just kind of a he can do everything type of linebacker, truly a modern linebacker that you can ask to to move forward and rush the passer, drop in coverage. But then he's got this sideline to sideline ability, but he makes plays at every stage. He racks up tackles, sacks, forced fumbles, interceptions. He, he's kind of the, the the longer, leaner version of the two and, and has a lot more dynamic ability because of it. So they kind of complement each other. It's like floor versus ceiling, big bro versus little bro. And, and it's really cool to potentially see them come together. But going back to high school, both were two-way guys that were counted upon a lot on offense. And and you know by now, Alex, I love two-way players coming out of high school because they're just better equipped to not only handle the conditioning of of, of a college game, which is really something we don't talk about enough in that transition, but also they can take on more responsibility. They're, They're that much more fit to be counted upon earlier in the collegiate careers. And both of these guys, I don't think either guy sat more than a year or once they got to their respective schools, Uh, of course, Ivan coming from uh, Miami of Ohio uh, before transferring into Cincinnati. And and as soon as he hit the portal, you just kind of knew, right? You're like, okay, yeah, this this is going, this is going to be a Cincinnati deal. Kind of like Corey kind of, you just knew the moment the portal became an option. You knew something positive was about to happen for Luke Fickle's program. So, I think this is cool from a football standpoint. Certainly having that much experience next to each other is going to be very valuable every single Saturday. But I think just from a human standpoint, it's just pretty darn cool to see these brothers coming back together after, what, four years apart playing for different colleges in the state, just, you know, 40 miles apart or whatever it is. Really cool to see them coming back together and very much looking forward uh, to seeing both of them as, as, as Cincinnati Bearcats. It's interesting because Deshaun comes into the University of Cincinnati and he was kind of, you know, low on the depth chart when he first, uh, in 2020, his freshman season. Then all of a sudden last year, he bursts onto the scene with four interceptions and 95 tackles. He's the leading returning tackler on this team. So now he's gone from being just an overlooked player and other player on the team to now potentially being the best player, not only on the defense, but maybe on the entire team. With you look at all the preseason watch lists, excuse me, and um, accolades he's accruing in leading up to kickoff in, what, 30 days from now? So, yes, sir. I mean, what 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 has happened that has caused this meteoric rise for Deshaun? I think he was just prepared. Like I said, two-way ability coming out of, of high school, a whole lot of playmaking within that two-way responsibility uh, that he had at the prep level. So sometimes I think, and look, he's a longer, leaner guy, right? So I do think there was some physical needs that he had to address in that first year on campus, whether it's the weight room, the nutritional program, all that stuff. But clearly he put in the work and, and he came out, you know, 215 or so last year, big enough to contend really at every level. You know, you, you have enough fluidity to play in coverage, at the second or third level, like the interceptions show you, but then you also have enough, you know, meat on your bones to play with the big guys up front and mix it up in the front seven. Even if you're beating blockers with speed and efficiency, which he does more likely than taking on some of these linemen or or even tight ends in the box, uh, but you could still contend with those guys on occasion. So I think sometimes you just need to see the physical match up to the potential. And then all of a sudden you see, explosions like this where it seemingly comes out of nowhere but i think that's the beauty of 
college football and the resources that these big time programs have is you can totally transform your your body but then all of that matches up to your natural skills and athleticism and you can become a bit of a swiss army knife like like deshaun has at, at uc and now again he gets to to pair that with his brother who's kind of as as straight laced downhill as it gets from the linebacker perspective uh and, and and play off of each other almost it's like a great point guard and shooting guard where one guy's going to be catch and shoot and kind of always ready for it and that point guard's going to knife in and out and navigate and, and do everything for, for almost for the other guy to, to be freed up a little bit more so again i can't wait to see these two line up next to each other and i'm curious how they're going to do it you know from a name standpoint do you just go with you know I and then period, or do you do you stretch it out and you put the whole the whole name on there and you just say screw it, you know nil yeah. value all that, you know let's let's roll the dice a little bit. So I think visually it'll be cool as well. Talk to me about Ivan because I I'm wondering if he can translate his game that he played at Miami, which is the Mid American Conference, which I've been told is not a very good conference. Can he translate that to the American? Because the American is a step up. Like, you know, the American's branded itself as the power six. Can Ivan translate his game to much higher competition? I think so. Because when you do it in the MAC, particularly on defense, it means you're doing it truly in wide open spaces. You know, and I think the game at every conference level has pushed closer to that MACTION kind of perception right everybody's playing spread football lateral yeah. football jet sweeps bubble screens playing basketball on grass as they say where spacing has become such a such a key in in setting up defenses so a guy who is already equipped and experienced to deal with more of that spacing i think that will help him transition quite well and, and then you can't teach the experience either um you know wh whether he was the truly the, the mac defensive player of the year or not depending on the outlet that type of volume and experience top 10 tackler in the nation you can't do that without an understanding of playing in space execution physicality athleticism and also iq and a lot of those same concepts we see in the mac will be present in the American or the Big Ten or the SEC or the ACC. Wherever you go, you're going to see a lot of those same concepts because, again, the, the air raid, wide open nature of high school football and, and lower end FBS football has jumped up towards the Power Five and even the NFL level with, with some of those similar concepts, RPOs, quick game, no huddle, all of that. That, that started at, at the high school level and at the low end power five level and and you could credit the mac in general with with some of that association yeah. so familiarity there will help no matter who the opponent is most likely for cincinnati can't wait to see that on display it's all up tempo offense we know that we know smu and ucf they're up tempo so can't wait to see that so and that's great that you think it's going to translate well to the american for ivan pace and that uh transitions well into the next conversation i know we've talked about this before but we're going to revisit it linebackers in the Big 12. You say it's an it's an important position to have. I agree with you. We'll also talk about some wide receivers. That coming up after a word from two of our sponsors. Thank you, LinkedIn Jobs, for being the official recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. John Garcia, Jr., our director of football recruiting for Sports Illustrated, joining me today here on Locked On Bearcats. So we talk about Malik Elzey. We talk about the linebackers, particularly the Pace brothers, I want to ask you this. I don't, think, I don't know if I've ever asked you this. I'm Jaheim Thomas. Like, I, I've been reading that he is finally going to get his moment this season of being a starter. Uh, what can we expect from him and what really is going to be his first dose of uh, high football action? Well, if it was anything like Deshaun's, it, it should be a pretty high expectation. But again, I think the, the skill set is a little bit different, right? A little bit more of a classic linebacker who won't have to – go outside of that box as much, right? I think when you talk about the Pace brothers, you're getting, like we talked about, you're getting a dynamic do-it-all guy in Deshaun. You're getting more of a straight-laced Mike linebacker type in, in Ivan. So I think here you can be a little bit of a blend of the two. So if you allow that athleticism that got him to UC to kind of take over, I think that the moment is right. And again, we talked about being in the system for a year and how valuable something like that can absolutely be and, and my gosh when, when you talk about even the big 12 defense is becoming such a bigger part of the conversation so even a year of, of sitting 
will allow you uh, to, to really blossom at the next level. And I think this UC defense is, is going to look and feel different, but a lot of these new names should be trusted and almost given the benefit of the doubt going into the season, uh, especially, again, when you said the linebacker core is maybe the strength of the entire team, a lot of that will enable freedom for the, the, the guys who line up that aren't, you know, wearing pace on their back. You know, that will allow for a little bit more narrow responsibility uh, and a little bit more clear indication of what to do pre and post snap, uh, depending on how uh, you know, the rest of fall camp goes and all of that. So I agree with you. I think the linebacker core is going to be solid, high, high floors across the board, even with those who have, you know, less experience. So here's the thing about linebackers to me. 15 years ago, they sold tickets. I mean, you look at some of your big physical linebackers throughout throughout history. Ray Lewis, Brian Urlacher, Lance Briggs. I mean, the linebackers, when I first started watching football in the mid-2000s, those were the players who sold tickets. Now, it's the offense that sells tickets. So, does that mean you're recruiting linebackers who are more athletes as opposed to just physical specimens, John? Yeah, because some of those guys that you grew up watching in the mid-2000s, I mean, those guys were 250, 255 pounds. LeVon Kirkland, LeVar Arrington, Andy Katzenmoyer, some of these big-name guys that, that, like you mentioned, these were borderline defensive linemen in terms of height and weight in today's game. Again, the game has gotten smaller, faster, and wider. Basketball on grass. What do we see in basketball? The center position is dying by the day, it seems like, although there's a little bit of a revival with the Joel Embiid's of the world. But for the most part, the best big men are fluidity, you know, passers, shooters, guys that are doing the unconventional and help you maximize that space. We're seeing that at the football level as well, where these pass rushers are, are more Von Miller and Khalil Mack as opposed to Reggie White and Bruce Smith. They're smaller. They can bend that much more. So naturally, you have to combat that with offensive tackles who are longer and, and have a little bit more athleticism. So it goes to the linebacker position as well because it's about three-down ability. Do you have to stop the run with bulk and a physicality to be able to come downhill? Yeah, you still got to do that. But most people are throwing the ball on first down, and, and, and some people pass every down. So you've got to be able to retreat play laterally and play underneath coverage. It's more important than it's ever been. So your Lawrence Taylors, who are linebackers that really doubled down as pass rushers, unless that is the specialty of the linebacker, you're not going to be asked to do that as much as you used to because you've got to run with these freaky athletic tight ends. You've got to deal with these slot receivers that are getting – more crafty and polished by the day, and some of these running backs that are more equipped to catch the football out of the backfield. You've got to mirror that position in particular the most, right, the running back spot. Yeah. If you look at O-linemen, D-linemen are the counter. Running backs, it's linebacker. Receivers, it's the defensive back. So the running back position is going through the same thing. If you're just a downhill runner who's also a good blocker but you can't catch out of the backfield – you're going to see yourself as a limited role type of running back. So it's the same thing at linebacker. If you're more equipped to stuff the run, but you can't play in space, rush the passer or cover, then on third down, you're going to be subbed out for a defensive back or a rover or a safety type who is more equipped to handle those situations. So, yeah, yeah. linebackers are smaller. They're faster. They're quicker. They're more apt to play in coverage because that's where the game has gone from an offensive standpoint, which has often been the driver. You said in the early 2000s, it was about these big physical downhill backers. Well, people were in the I formation with fullbacks, you know, coming downhill right at you, maybe some counter or some sweeps to go off of that. But yeah, you needed those guys to take on fullbacks and then finish the job thereafter. Fullbacks are all but gone. Everybody's using tight ends as hybrids now. And again, those guys are longer and more pass first guys uh, more times than not. So again, the linebackers have to shift the same way. So, and I think that's what makes this UC linebacking core ready for the big 12. It's like we talked about already today. Deshaun is a downhill player. Ivan's a downhill player. Gaheem Thomas, you know, he's not like your uh, linebacker from 15 years ago, but what yeah. about Wilson Huber? Because to me, he's a little bit bigger than the other three that I mentioned. Like, so is this linebacking core to you ready to play in the Big 12? Now, Wilson Huber won't be in the Big 12, unfortunately. He's in his sixth year. Right. But the Pace brothers, if Ivan stays for another year, he will be. Uh, Yaheem Thomas, I, I think he will be as well. So the, the Bearcats are going to be taking a pretty good linebacking core into the Big 12, right? 
hundred percent. Not as familiar with Huber, but look, if he's got downhill ability and, and more size and girth and physicality, you still need that. I, I don't want to make it seem like that is totally gone. Look, you still got to take on tight ends. You still got to take on H backs. You still have to meet the running back in the hole with the ball or beat the running back when he's set up to pass protect against you. So there's still certainly a lot of room for more of that traditional physicality and downhill ability from the linebacker position. The point is, though, you have to counter it if you want to stay on the field. But again, Cincinnati loaded in the secondary seemingly every year. They might, even if he was more apt to playing in, in, in coverage, you still might be taking him off the field because you just might have a player who's better in that you know third down uh, type of down and distance. So I, I do think it's a good thing. And again, you want that variance. We talked about it with the yeah. brothers. You want a variance to where, yeah, if you do face a team, you mentioned Arkansas, who is known for up-tempo. They're up-tempo, but they want to run the ball. And they'll use the quarterback to run the ball. And it's a big physical quarterback, by the way. So your smaller, shiftier linebackers aren't in that game going to be as equipped UCF it's a it's a spread offense but it's a power spread offense that again wants to run the football they got one of the best running back cores in the entire country you need your linebackers to come downhill against the Knights so it, it depends on the opponent there's still a lot of elements of power football it's just presented differently in some of these spread formats uh, but more times than not it's usually spread to pass more so than spread to run with Arkansas and UCF it's just a couple of the exceptions nationally so I know you've mentioned this, that Big 12 teams are running the football more often. I agree with that. You look at some of the running backs that have come out of that conference recently, but wide receivers, I, I think, John, you and I can both agree that th that is still a, a huge position of priority because let's be honest, the Big 12, when you think of Big 12 offenses, you think of spread offenses, air raids. So is wide receiver still in a, a position of importance when we talk about recruiting for Cincinnati going into the Big 12? Yeah, 100%. You know, even with Texas and Oklahoma out of there, yeah, you still think of some of these pass happy programs. Oklahoma State is always going to air it out. Texas Tech, my goodness, they will absolutely air it out, you know, no matter who the coach is, it, it seems yeah. like. So, yeah, you still have to be prepared to defend that, uh, even as some of these cultures change, right? Baylor used to be known for that. They're a little bit more conservative now and, and defensively focused under Dave Aranda. But, yeah, you, you have to be able to do both. And that's really – what it comes down to, you know, the play that won the big 12 title last year was a defensive stop oh, against yeah. the run. Right. I mean, oh, so, yeah. so yeah. And it was a defensive game. I think the final score was like 24, 21, which in today's standards is a defensive game. So you still have to be able to come downhill and play ball. And I think the big 12 is migrating a little bit more towards that identity, but yeah, the foundation is still very much a wide open offensive style. So, yeah, I do think that you're going to have to combat it. Look, and, and you think of the teams that are coming into the Big 12, Houston and BYU in particular, they're known for chucking it around as well. So it's not just the teams yeah. that are already there. It's your fellow newcomers into the, into the Big 12 as well. So, yeah, obviously wide receivers, defensive backs in this day and age, look, it's, it's really – it's chalk at this point. It goes without saying that group has to be prepared. Uh, you know, that that's you got to score and, and you got to stop others from throwing the ball. I mean, that's really the foundation of, of how to to win. You know, I think the, the turnover game is always the most important stat in terms of dictating a winner and a loser. But the, the number two stat that has emerged over the last few years is chunk plays. The team with the bigger chunk plays wins the game. It's almost as important as the turnover game. So offensively you're going to get that more times than not via the pass co compared to the run and then defensively you need to limit those chunk plays again most of them yeah. come via the pass so it it is it is a well-rounded conversation and the conference i think will be well-rounded from a stylistic standpoint but of course all things even you know more teams are going to pass the football than they're going to run and that number is not going the other way it seems like it's trending that way more times than not yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. And uh, John, it's always great to have you on. We are 30 days away from kickoff in Fayetteville. The Bearcats and Arkansas will have much more conversations, or many more conversations, rather, I'm sure, leading up to that game. I even also ask you about some Arkansas players, uh, just so Bearcats fans can know about them and what they're up against, what this team is up against come September 3rd in Fayetteville. He's John Garcia, Jr. He's the Director of Football Recruiting for Sports Illustrated. As always, John, thank you very much. For coming on Lockdown Bearcats, great to have you back. I mean, it, it, here's something interesting for you listening to this. See, I've I've been supposed to have John on the previous 
two weeks. <laughs> Listen, when you work in the news producing business, you never know what kind of day you're going to get. I had my day planned out where I was going to take a dinner break, come home and do the interview. But then, of course, news breaks and you have to be there. So no, no offense to you, John, but sometimes the, the news cycle, and I'm sure you, you're used to this, the news cycle never yeah. stops. Yes. But um, great to have you back today. Hope to have you back on next week in the weeks leading up to the season. Best wishes to you, and I uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Always a pleasure, Alex. Thanks for having me on. He's John Garcia, Jr., the director of football recruiting for Sports Illustrated. That conversation and, or rather, excuse me, that conversation today and every week presented by LinkedIn Jobs. I'd like to thank them once again for being the official recruiting sponsor across the college or the Locked On College Network football recruiting sponsor and basketball as well for uh, when we have Jason Jordan on from Sports Illustrated. That's going to do it for me today here on Locked On Bearcats. On tomorrow's show, how short of a leash has Ben Bryan on as fall camp is underway? It's a very unique situation, and in a way, I do feel bad for him. So I'll explain that tomorrow. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Frankie underscore 90 with two N's and an ATI. You can follow me on Instagram, AlexFrank9 underscore and email me at alex3frank at gmail.com. Thanks, as always, for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. Now get more on the Big 12 by making Lockdown Big 12 your second listen with everyday host Josh Neighbors and the local experts of Lockdown as they take you across the Big 12 in 30 minutes. Lockdown Big 12, make it your second listen. That's Lockdown Big 12. For the Lockdown Bearcats podcast, my name is Alex Frank. Have a great rest of your day. Uh, I will be there. There's a football game tonight. There's an NFL game tonight, the Hall of Fame game. The Raiders and Jaguars can catch that game, I believe, on NBC. But anyway, there's a football game tonight. Football season's here, ladies and gentlemen. It is here. So get ready for the Lockdown Bearcats podcast, which, by the way, I'll be in Charleston for the uh, season opener at, at Arkansas. So I'll be recording potentially poolside that weekend. Stay tuned. For the Lockdown Bearcats podcast, I'm Alex Frank. Have a great rest of your day, and I will be back tomorrow.